an essential contribution to the political economy of East European economic crisis and crisis resolution regimes. Daniela introduced to political economy several new concepts, um, such as the financialization of sovereign bonds and interbank collateral markets in developing, com developed economies, and provided one of the earliest critiques of the IMF's half step on revisiting its position on uh, freedom of capital flows um, in 2010. Uh, currently, Daniela is involved in an extensive foray in the shady dynamics of the shadow banking uh, in Europe. Daniela, the floor. Thank you, Cornel, and uh, thank you again to the organizers for the invitation. I'm afraid I have to treat you to another 20 minutes of uh, central banking. Uh, this uh, reflects, uh, the presentation today reflects uh, um, two papers that I've been writing on, on the DCB and how central banks learn from each other in crisis. Um, I thought I would, I would uh, put less of the technicalities in it because uh, tr trying to take into account the audience. But okay, uh, just to confirm my credentials, I will start with a, with a graph. <laughs> right? uh, this is the kind of graph that central banks used to present before 2008 when they went to conferences. And this I've taken from Ben Bernanke, a 2004 speech, where he uh, put forward this idea that central banks never had it so good. And he said, well, if you look at the line in the 1970s, we had a lot of uh, volatility in output, volatility in inflation, a problem of central banking. All these changed after 1984 with a particular model that I'll explain in a second, the model called uh, the, the Great Moderation Model. So the idea was uh, we have seen uh, better policy and uh, more and more central banks shifting towards, towards this model, right? So before 2008, uh, a very self-congratulatory mood. Uh, I think now the best way to think about uh, central banking is this picture. For those of you who have followed uh, the Financial Times, yesterday there was a, uh, or two days ago, there was a G7 conference where Japan, where, where uh, countries had to say something about uh, the Japanese uh, uh, shift towards more aggressive monetary easing and what that means for uh, the, the world economy. Uh, and uh, now the term currency wars that was uh, introduced by Brazil in 2010 has become very popular again. So central banks are not so happy anymore and they are uh, looking at uh, conflicts or political struggles in, in both uh, uh, the national and the political sphere. And this is very important um, not only for, for high income countries, I'm sorry the graphs are really small, but uh, I thought I, I, I wasn't sure how this was going to look. Anyways, this, uh, this third graph shows how Latin American currencies have been appreciated, uh, appreciating sin since 2009. And uh, it shows that more and more countries in the world are getting involved in this, um, in this idea of a currency war. Basically, uh, central banks in high income countries print money or create or expand their balance sheets in order to deal with the crisis. That money moves from those countries into uh, uh, emerging markets it produces an exchange rate appreciation and then the possibility of, of further crisis. I'll, I'll discuss that in a second. So there is concern all, all over the place about it and uh, the, that translates into uh, uh, a sort of um, the fun exercise uh, in that uh, global commercial banks are doing now is to map uh, the possibility or the, the potential of uh, which central bank would engage or will enter the currency war next. So, so we are, uh, all these little graphs show how much uh, the, the exchange rate is viewed to be uh, overvalued or, un or undervalued and what is the, the possibility that central banks will become more active. Okay, so what we have seen, and I'll try to discuss this uh, in, in this presentation, is that we've moved from convergence before 2008 with, uh, uh, in terms of uh, central banking models to uh, an increasing divergence. Uh, and, and that comes from um, the fact that since 2008 we have had uh, an overt uh, repo repoliticiz repoliticization of, of central banks and this idea of, of monetary conflict. And I, I would like to argue that there is a struggle that we have seen both at the national level because the concept of central bank independence is losing um, its power and also at transnational level with this idea of, of currency wars. We are no longer, um, central banks no longer agree with each other what is uh, the best way to uh, to uh, uh, manage the international financial system. Uh, very briefly, to take you through a bit of uh, uh, economics, the Great Moderation Model or the New Keynesian uh, Model, um, I think uh, it was a very powerful narrative of macroeconomic government, governance. It just told uh, everybody, if the central bank uh, moves the interest rate uh, in, in a certain way, it has the proper models, then it, it can deliver price stability. And uh, 
uh, with the academic scholarship coming from the US, we had this idea that central banks, uh, the central bank in basic was about the, the management of expectations. If you can be a credible central bank, all will, will go well, right? <coughs> and there are lots of critiques around this, uh, but basically uh, the, the core idea was that central banks uh, can manage uh, uh, an economy because uh, financial markets are efficient and they respond in a very predictable way to uh, interest rate decisions. And very strangely, these are, were models without finance, so basically uh, all, all, the mo all those models had one interest rate to capture the complexity of the global financial system, but they had uh, performative plausibility. In some ways it worked, right? The Bernanke was right when he showed that graph uh, uh, with the lower output volatility and lower um, inflation volatility. Of course, they didn't care very much about financial stability then, because they thought, if you, do, if you deliver economic stability, you, then you're fine, they, you, they won't have financial crisis. And we know that that worked well. And uh, maybe to respond to, to some of the uh, questions that Professor Schmidt raised, uh, I think the central bank was the, per the perfect neoliberal institution in the sense that we had this idea that the central bank was independent both, both from governments and from the markets. I don't think that any public institution can claim that, uh, that the position or could have claimed, they don't claim it anymore. So the idea was that uh, the, this new government, the gray moderation model that central banks followed allowed, uh, allowed them to be independent from uh, governments. There was no point in trying to uh, coordinate with the fiscal, policy, uh, fiscal authority because it undermines fiscal discipline, right? So it was a bad idea to, co to try to coordinate or to take into account fiscal policy decisions. But then there was something that the, it's less discussed in the literature, this idea of market neutrality. The central bank only intervened in one market segment uh, in order to implement uh, or, uh, its interest rate decisions and the uh, financial markets would do the job for, for it, right? So there was a very clear one intervention no, uh, well, at least central banks claim that there was no uh, direct intervention in the allocation of resources in the economy. The financial uh, system did that. Okay. Uh, and there was a, a sort of global diffusion of this idea that uh, usually called inflation targeting. Uh, the IMF had a 2006 paper where it, it uh, uh, mapped the, the rapid spread of uh, this new consensus model throughout the, the world in, in emerging markets. Uh, in high-income countries, most... most uh, most central banks adopted it. There was one exception, there was uh, Japan, and Japan, with its uh, particular history, uh, had a, uh, gone through what we call now unconventional monetary policies. In other words, had to do, uh, it, well, it, it did in some ways uh, try to provide price stability, but with very unconventional <coughs> methods. And after Lehman, everybody started following Japan in some way or, or another, uh, through uh, what the literature calls balance sheet policies in the sense that the central bank ab ab abandoned both the principle of political neutrality and the principle of market neutrality, and they started intervening in uh, financial markets, not to enforce interest rate decisions, because interest rate decisions were already lower to zero, but uh, to try to provide a more uh, stimulating uh, environment or to respond to the, to the financial crisis. So going far beyond their, their original or their uh, model-informed uh, practice of uh, manipulating interest rates. And <clears throat> to show you how uh, important that was since uh, 2007, um, everybody in well, most, most uh, high-income countries went unconventional. Very interestingly, Japan was the only exception to that. So if you see the size of the balance sheet of central banks in UK, US, uh, Switzerland, Eurozone, and Australia, uh, they increased quite rapidly after Lehman, uh, with the exception of Japan. And we'll come back to that. I think that explains why Japan now has entered the currency war, or has, is, is using more actively its, uh, its balance sheet uh, in order to provide a stimulus. So since 2007, we abandoned, the 2008, sorry, we abandoned this model of the gray moderation and moving more and more towards a, an unconventional uh, approach. Okay, and so the question is, why, how did they move to that and, and what, what role uh, Japan's experience placed in it? And I, I've argued that most of the, again, um, uh, invo engaging with the question of the role of ideas and the strategic use of ideas, uh, central bankers in high-income countries, particularly in the US and UK, took or uh, interpreted the Japanese experience through a particular theoretical uh, model, using the, the, the theoretical model of the great moderation. So they said, okay, we have to target risk spreads. <coughs> the problem is that in a crisis, 
uh, risk premiums increased a lot because there is a lot of uncertainty. So let's uh, go into private financial, uh, private asset markets and try to reduce uh, uh, risk spreads. In other, in other words, uh, ease uh, funding conditions. Okay, and. Uh, so we have had purchases here in the U.S. of mortgage-backed securities or asset-backed securities. And, and then with quantitative easing, everybody basically, well, everybody for, for the ECB moved towards uh, purchasing government bonds. Uh, or th another lesson that was learned from Japan was that uh, central banks had to be more aggressive than Japan was. So increase their balance sheet much, much faster. And, and Bernanke, well, some say, was very well placed to become uh, head of the Federal Reserve because he was one of the most important uh, well, m most uh, influential scholars on, on the <coughs> Japanese uh, crisis in, um, throughout the early 2000s. Okay, what, what was lost in translation and uh, what wasn't taken into account, and I think uh, it's part of, and in, it links with the, your presentation on, on the role of, uh, of global banks, is uh, several issues to take into account. First, uh, because of the theoretical disposition of the central banks that started unconventional monetary policies, the, the uh, stress was still on prices, right? So these are central banks that care, care, care about prices, about yield spreads. So they didn't look very much in institutions. And part in particular, they didn't think very well about uh, uh, what, are, what are the consequences or what are the counterparties to their transactions, right? And in particular, I think the importance of global banks in that or, or in Eurozone cross-border banks um, wasn't taken into account into how they design monetary, uh, unconventional monetary policies. So in a sense, global banks have been the missing actors in, in the central bank analysis. And that's important to a certain extent because uh, global banks prefer uh, or make decisions about unconventional operations depending on both liquidity and profitability. So in a crisis, they still try to maintain some of that profitability, uh, uh, particularly if they were exposed to uh, High, le high leverage pro uh, activities before the crisis. And, and that, uh, by not looking or by missing the role of global banks in, in this process and in the way that unconventional monetary policies are designed, I think uh, we can see that two, do two governance gaps emerged at both national level and international level. I'm not going to focus very much on the domestic governance gap because it requires some technical that I'm, I don't think they are necessary here. Just to say that in terms of the domestic governance gap, what we have discovered is that we have moved towards a system where um, finance in general, and that's particularly the case for shadow banking, but finance in general has become increasingly collateral based. And it's become collateral based uh, and the main source of collateral for uh, uh, large global banks or government bond markets. In other words, private leverage is, bo is born in government bond, bank, government bond markets and it, it can destabilize them. And it, it produces this fiscal, fiscal financial stability link that uh, the, uh, the previous uh, presenter has discussed. So <clears throat> that raises the fact that coordination has to become uh, part of, uh, of a crisis management. And if you think about the ECB and the repeated failure to provide stability to the, to the European banking sector, I think that's a very political problem. It, it shows the, the importance of this do domestic governance gap. The only way to stabilize uh, that kind of a banking system is to uh, provide support to government bond markets. But that means you have to give up your central bank independence. And in the Eurozone context, that's a very difficult thing to do for a variety of reasons. There is also oh, some animation stuff. Uh, there is also a global governance gap, right? So it's not only a, a political struggle at the national level over what's happening to central banks, but there is increasingly a, a political struggle uh, at the international level, level. And th that again comes from the way that the central banks have refused to engage with the question of how do we re regulate global banks. Uh, and that, that global governance gap comes from the fact that uh, when you give uh, large commercial banks extraordinary liquidity in a crisis, you was, the, most central banks assume in their transmission mechanism that they will somehow go into the national uh, markets and start investing or start giving loans. Well, large commercial banks don't do that. They typically think much more globally. Oh, they think much more globally than that. And <clears throat> a very good example is something called the yen carry, a practice that appeared during uh, the years of the quantitative easing in Japan, where large financial institutions were borrowing. Yeah, maybe I can shout. <laughs> Uh, large financial institutions were borrowing in yens and they were funding or, or taking that money in order to do speculative attacks or speculative, to take speculative, speculative positions in other uh, high uh, or income markets or in emerging markets. And this is a paper written by 
one of the central bankers of Japan with the uh, uh, Princeton economist, and he basically argues that the Japanese quant quantitative easing program or the unconventional uh, monetary policy implemented by Japan during 2001 and 2006 play, has played a very important role in the way uh, that shadow, the shadow banking crisis in the U.S. has unfolded. And basically the argument is that most of the mortgage-backed securities or most of the stuff the, that ended up very toxic during the, fin uh, the U.S. financial crisis was ultimately uh, funded by, uh, in Japan, right? So it's a global carry trade that shows there are spillovers from Japan or from unconventional monetary policies into other markets, okay? And I think that with the, the fall of Lehman Brothers, what we have seen is that that particular yen carry has go gone global. Now, every, since everybody is doing unconventional monetary policies and we haven't yet regulated banks in order to prevent them to move capital through their internal capital markets across different jurisdictions, then what happens is that they have uh, taken uh, positions in high, uh, higher yielding countries. And this is why we're seeing the appreciation of several currencies in Latin America and in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, some in Africa, although I don't, I don't know very much about that, but I think Latin America and, uh, and uh, East Asia are, are good examples. And this is what underpins this idea of the currency war, simply uh, the fact that the uh, spillovers, uh, yes, the spillovers from uh, high-income countries have consequences for the financial stability of other countries, right? And central banks can't really engage with that, with that question and then what happens is that everybody has to do balance sheet policies, right? So everybody has to use their balance sheet in order to try to address uh, uh, financial stability. And I think this is a, a good picture of, of a currency war. It shows basically that ev every, well, most central banks in, in high-income countries and in, in large emerging markets are expanding their balance sheets rapidly for what they would say very different reasons, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, in a sense a, a, a zero-sum game. So countries in the euro area, the United Kingdom and the US, um, well, the countries, central banks in, the, in these countries are trying to uh, provide or to restore domestic stability, uh, trying to get growth going again, whereas countries in East Asia are using, uh, the central banks there are trying to use their uh, uh, balance sheets in order to intervene in foreign currency markets and pre prevent the appreciation of their domestic currencies. Because we know once your domestic currency starts appreciating, you're looking at asset bubbles and then you're looking at uh, financial stability problems. So I think that explains to, to a certain extent why Japan, since 2000, the late 2012, since the, uh, the election of a new prime minister, has decided uh, or has introduced something called EB economics. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well. This is a Financial uh, Times uh, uh, name. The, uh, the idea is that the Central Bank of Japan cannot afford to, to keep its balance sheet relatively stable as it had done until um, 2011. If you look at the graph, the, the green line shows the uh, outstanding volumes of uh, assets or liabilities of the, of the Central Bank of Japan. And you can see that Unlike the other uh, high counterparties in high-income countries, uh, Japan didn't really expand its balance sheet very much. So it tried to uh, resolve problems through other uh, means. And with that had come a very rapid appreciation of the yen. And having your currency appreciating is very bad for exports. I think I read the, um, a report, I think yesterday, that said for every 1% of the yen's appreciation, Toyota is losi losing 35 billion yen. So it's, it's something that is very fundamental to uh, export performance in Japan, and, and you can make the same argument for other countries. Okay, uh, just to conclude quickly, in, in this context, what it, what it seems like uh, is that the best way forward would be to exit, right? To return to the pre-crisis model, and I think this is what the central banks are, are wanting. I, this is a, a quote from uh, 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 one of the governors of federal... Uh, of the Central Bank of uh, Federal Reserve of New York, I think, that says it is sound policy to limit discretionary ability of central banks to, to do either fiscal uh, uh, policies or uh, to try to influence the, the credit decisions or credit allocations through private markets. So central banks are trying to recover this idea of, of central bank in independence, but I think that's very difficult to do be, uh, because they haven't answered some of the fundamental questions that the crisis has risen. One, one is that how do we uh, take into account the idea of globalized finance and the, the role that global banks play in moving cap capital across borders? And can we do that without a coordinated uh, a framework? And 
the second problem that I see is that the central, ba the central banks, and I think the ECB is the best example of that, have seen in their crisis a threat to their institutional position. And they, are tr have, they have been trying to defend that. Going back to independence would allow them to defend that, uh, that uh, sort of privileged institutional position, but uh, it doesn't seem to be working in terms of delivering growth and stability because it, uh, it basically uh, has gone hand in hand now since for two years with, uh, with austerity. So we still aren't clear about what should be the, the best relationship between uh, central banks and, and fiscal authorities. And in a collateral based system, how can uh, central banks sustain that independence? Thank you.